Right, there we go. Hello everyone, how's it going? Team here and this is BXJS Weekly episode 87, bringing you all the best JavaScript news in a podcast form. And this is possibly the tiniest episode we've ever had because for whatever reason, there is nothing happening this week. Uh, you know, I, I guess we can start joking about JavaScript dying yet again, but uh, let's, let's just get through this, shall we? There is a couple of interesting libraries and in news this time around, so... I guess let's just uh, get started. As usual, the first section we got here is getting started and we got a couple of pretty nice guides here today. The first one is hands-on guides developing and deploying Node.js apps in Kubernetes. So this is a very detailed, very long guide on uh, building and deploying your apps to Kubernetes. If you wanted to get started with Kubernetes but didn't know where to do that, specifically with Node.js apps, and this article basically got everything you have to know about the Kubernetes containers, preparing your app for shipping it with Kubernetes, and so on and so forth. As you can see here, the guide is very long, very detailed, and it's actually very well written. So if you wanted to get into Kubernetes uh, but didn't know where to start, then try this guide. Maybe this is exactly what you were looking for. The next thing we got here is modern JavaScript features you may have missed. A pretty nice outline of the ES 2015 and later features that are not as frequently used as say something like deconstruction or rest and spread. More niche ones, but you know, the ones that are still extremely useful, like for, for example, binary and octal literals like number dot is nan that is way more predictable in behavior than window.isnan, which is, you know, a bit finicky. And stuff like exponent operator, array prototype includes, which is something that I actually use quite a lot. I don't know about other people, but yeah. So yeah, if you are basically writing uh, the ES5 a lot, but not sure about all the new features and never went through them, and this guide basically got everything you want to know covered pretty nicely, so do check it out. Right, and the last thing we got here today is how to build your first Telegram chatbot with Node.js. So this is uh, another very detailed guide on uh, building a Telegram chatbot. This one includes, well, basically everything you ever need to know about building a Telegram bot, starting from the registration of the new bot using the bot father. So you don't even basically have to go to the official Telegram uh, tutorials to figure out what to do because this uh, tutorial includes everything you have to know including setting up the projects and using no Telegram bot API for doing that. Uh, this is not my favorite library. So I think the Telegraph is a lot nicer than this. But this one is still, you know, it works uh, relatively well. So if you are curious about that, do check it out. Hey, Bakao, welcome to the stream. Right, that is literally it for the getting started section, just three articles. As I said, you know, today is a very tiny episode for some reason. So next thing we got here is articles and news section. We do have quite some interesting things here today. So the first one is playing Beat Saber in the browser with body movements and using PoseNet and TensorFlow. So if you never heard about Beat Saber, it's a VR game that basically attaches lightsabers to your controllers and you have to chop nodes according to the music in VR, it's super fun, really great. Uh, the harder difficulties are insane. I still don't understand how people can do that, but it's really fun. So the challenge here is to allow playing your Beat Saber using your webcam, which obviously, you know, you won't be able to do the super hard difficulties, but playing on easy would probably be pretty damn fun. So the article walks you through uh, how exactly could you do this? There's, yeah, there's also some GIFs of the actual Beat Saber footage. That is, I think this is like normal difficulty, but anyway, it's a really fun write up on showing uh, how exactly you can use camera and pose detection to do stuff like, you know, cutting things in uh, Beat Saber basically, right? So it uses the Beat Saber viewer, which is the custom open source project for custom uh, songs where you can create your custom levels and upload them for people to use basically, right? And uh, what it does is essentially overrides the uh, Beat Saver, changes it a bit to react to your actual hands position using the PoseNet and TensorFlow to, well, actually play the game in a browser, which, you know, it's <laughs> obviously it's not going to be the speed and precision of a Beat Saber, but it's still quite fun. So if that sounds like an interesting project, do check the article out, it's actually pretty good. And there's like a lot of very interesting things in here. Um, again, yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy that you can actually do that right now in a browser, but uh, there you go. 
Right, and the second article we got here for today is why is React concurrent mode exciting? So this is, you know, the last week we talked about the React announcing concurrent mode in the experimental builds. And uh, it's a very tricky thing, right? So concurrent mode is not a simple thing and it's way, um, way harder to understand what exactly it is and how it works than you might think at first. So this article tries to explain what ex exactly is concurrent mode and why would you need it and when would you need it? Uh, so if you read the previous React concurrent mode documentation from React and you still don't quite understand it, try going through this article. Maybe this will explain the stuff for you. Uh, hey, Captain Nosia, that, that, <laughs> that username. Um, as usual, the stream will be available on YouTube uh, right, in, right after I finish streaming. So you can just watch the VOD at your own pace. No worries about, you know, don't, don't try to watch it if your internet is struggling. So just, you know, just this. All right, um, coming back to the article. Yes, React Concurrent Mode, very well explained, very well written up. Why would you need it? Uh, also talks about that most of the people want actually need the concurrent mode and, you know, your current version of React would work just fine but the concurrent mode can still offer some advantages for you as well. So if you are still not quite sure why concurrent mode is uh, required, when would you need it and why should you even care about that, do check this article out as basically has everything you want to know. That is it for the articles and news actually for today. Again, like this, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what's going on this week. I guess it's Halloween and nobody's just doing anything. Everyone's just celebrating the Halloween. All uh, right, coming up next, we got tips, tricks, and bit-sized awesomeness. The first one is this um, logic map, I guess. Uh, pattern map, I'm not sure how to call this correctly, but it's a flow, flow chart, I guess. And uh, it's titled, everyone has JavaScript, right? And it basically reminds you that you as a JavaScript developer should keep in mind that a lot of people will not have JavaScript enabled, so you must make sure that your website works without JavaScript. And there's also some uh, very non-obvious things basically with regards to how JavaScript is processed and executed, right? And some caveats that can be like, you know, the corporate firewall that blocks JavaScript, or there's a mobile operator that interferes with downloaded JavaScript with, for example, Sky that accidentally blocked jQuery at some point, and then Comcast that mutates the scripts and inserts ads in them. So yeah, there is some very non-obvious things. I personally still have JavaScript completely disabled on the mobiles unless um, website absolutely needs it, like this rarely happens, uh, which is actually a neat thing because on the desktop, if you disable JavaScript, majority of sites just stop working at all. Like even, even non, so I have the U matrix, right? And it disables the third party stuff by default. It only allows CSS and images. The funny thing is that majority of sites, if you, even if you just disallow third party stuff, they just break. Like sometimes you don't even see anything rendered, which is ridiculous. You just see like an empty page. Mobile sites are a bit better. So I basically stick to using the mobile phone with the JavaScript off, which, well, you know, less stuff to load, more, it loads faster essentially and stuff like this. But anyway, this, this sort of walkthrough is a pretty good write up on why it is important to always keep in mind that JavaScript might not be enabled and you should always test your website to work without JavaScript. Luckily for us developers, that's really easy to do with stuff like Next.js, uh, Gatsby, or, you know, the server side renders technologies. So just, you know, t take care of that tiny bit and make sure that you show at least something to the user that he can, you know, interact with. Uh, hey, Dragon, welcome to the stream. All right, continuing, we got an announcement from the Vasmer guys. Uh, they ported OpenSSL to Vasi, and you can now run it in a browser using the WebAssembly.shell. So you can just, uh, yeah, literally, um, all right, I probably blocked the XHR request. There we go. Oh, God damn it. Come on now. Come on now. Um, that should be allowed. Let me just refresh that. And you can literally generate. Undefined is not a function. Uh, well, I guess not yet. Maybe something is broken, but last time I checked it, it actually worked. But you can use OpenSSL to generate, verify, sign, and you know do all this crazy stuff with it basically right in your browser, which is um, pretty mind blowing to be honest. Uh, so there's a GIF showing that it actually works. And when I tested it last time, it also was working. I guess maybe they published a slightly broken build or maybe my cache is outdated or something. But um, yeah, it's, 
it's actually pretty crazy that you can just run the OpenSSL in WebAssembly right now, but there you go. All right, next thing we got here is a pretty cool announcement from uh, Mr. Miles Borins, who is one of the Node.js uh, team members, essentially core team members. And he just announced, I think it was yesterday, that the modules team within Node.js finally managed to reach consensus on path to unflag ES modules in Node.js core. So we can expect something to land very soon. I don't know about you, but I am heck of an excited to finally be able to use import statements in Node.js without Babel or any flags or anything like that. And this just is, you know, very, very cool. So fingers crossed to be, you know, this stuff shipping in the next, I don't know, month, two months maybe or something after five years. It's not five years, that's not fair, but yes, it did take them quite a bit, but I'm actually really happy that they took so much time because Right now, the model that they have right now is a lot better than what was originally proposed, where it would basically break everything and there was like no compat with uh, common JS. Now it's a lot more backwards compatible, a lot more compatible with the common JS modules. You no longer have to do, you know, crazy magic to actually make interop with common JS work. And it just looks a lot better. So yes, it took a long time, but I think the result is actually really cool. So cannot wait to see this shipped and cannot wait to get my hands on it basically. All right, continuing, we got Chrome Canary guts optional chaining, another feature I'm extremely excited about. So this is gonna be coming to the Canary within the next couple of days. Uh, you're gonna be able to use the optional chaining within the Canary, which means that it's probably gonna get shipped uh, in the V8.7, what, 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 I think it will be V8.80 because 7.9 is already in beta version right now. So yeah, this is like, this is one of the features that I've used with Babel and it is absolutely killer when you're working with the JSON that you are, you know, you kind of know the structure but not sure and need to validate that the nested objects properly exist and this feature is just amazing. So yes, properties like this, this, like I cannot wait for this to land in all the browsers and Node.js specifically because you know, you work with uh, um, with data a lot there. Um, yes, no more and and yay and and works. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So quite excited to see that there is the Chrome status uh, page as usual. So you can actually track it. Uh, Safari and Firefox have it shipped by the way, if you were curious. So Edge is obviously going to get it as soon as Chromium has and Chromium is probably going to ship it in uh, version 80, right? So it's, it is behind the flag in, in 80 right now. Is it? Wait a second. The current version is like, what is it? 78, right? Yeah, exactly. So 80 is still behind the flag, but there's a chance that by the time it releases is going to come uh, without the flag. Yeah, I mean, cannot wait, cannot wait. This is like very exciting. Right, continuing, we got an announcement from Mozilla add-ons team. Um, the, um, they announced that there's gonna be upcoming changes to extension side loading, and the side loading will no longer work in Firefox. Now, a lot of people got confused by the wording here because, you know, side loading is typically seen as you as a user just load custom extension into browser, right? And this is not what they're talking about. So you still will be able to load custom extensions as a developer, as a user, whatever, they don't block this. What they mean by side loading is actually the extensions that got installed by the third parties. You know, when you install some sort of um, app and it basically silently adds some kind of crappy extensions into your browser that you never wanted. So this will no longer work. Uh, Chrome did that uh, and uh, I think Safari also uh, applied this change quite some time ago, even like more than a year ago, if I remember correctly. Firefox now following in their steps essentially and also prohibiting side loading at all. So no more crappy extensions installed from the third party apps. You now will have to explicitly install them yourself. So the apps would basically, I don't know, open a page and tell you, hey, you know, click here if you wanna install it. Otherwise it will not work, which is again, welcome change. The amusing thing is that the original article was so uh, poorly worded, let's just put it this way, that they had to add this very big update saying that no, we are not prohibiting users from installing extensions. It's about the third parties, which is, uh, yeah, quite amusing, but uh, there you go. Okay, uh, next thing we got here is the Firefox privacy protection reveals who's trying to track you. So, so if you didn't know the Firefox ship, the privacy protection, uh, like the tracker blockers uh, by default since version 70, I think. 
or what would be kind of was it 70 I'm, I'm so confused about the version like the browser versions now because what was the Firefox version wait a second what is the current one um that is let me just dock it over here um help about Firefox it is 70 okay right so I guess there's like a minor update but we're gonna do that later Anyway, so they ship the tracker protection on by default and uh, there are some mind blowing numbers. So even with their, you know, kind of mild protection, I guess. So they have this enhanced tracking protection that blocks majority of trackers and tries not to break the web because there's a lot of pages that actually will break if you try to do that. Again, if you're using something like Umatrix or uBlock Origin with uh, tracking protection, you know that very well. Um, their tracking protection tries to be sort of less aggressive and you know not to break anything. Still, even with that protection, they manage to uh, block over 400 billions trackers since July, which is mind blowing. Like this is insane. Just think about that. So if you're still not you know not trying to protect yourself from trackers in some way, then well maybe it's a time to rethink it. If you're a lazy person, just get a Firefox. Uh, the protection they have seems to be quite good. If you are not lazy, then I would highly recommend again uBlock Origin and uMatrix. Both of those are indispensable extensions in my opinion. Uh, Brave is also a good option. True, yes, uh, absolutely. They also have a pretty good protection uh, from both ads and trackers. So yes, Brave is a great option indeed. That is a fair point. I keep forgetting about it. Like I have it installed, but I never actually launch it. I only use it on my mobile phone because of the how convenient the switching in the, you know, the the shields is for the like disabling, enabling JavaScript and all that stuff. But yeah, all right. Continuing, we got a thread on what suspense is and isn't, as well as some interesting new capabilities it adds. Again, if you are working with React and you are still not sure what suspense is and how exactly it works and you know what can you actually do with it, then I would highly recommend you go through both of those threads. They are actually stemmed from the discussion between uh, people like Ben Lesht and Abramov and a bunch of other pretty uh, prominent JavaScript developers um, on Twitter at least um, that started discussing what is suspense and why why do we need it and how does it work so there is some very interesting stuff in here again you know if you're not working with react it's probably not interesting for you or if you don't care about the suspense and concurrent modes as well there's probably nothing new here ben lesh indeed is just trolling but um his trolling ended up into something really awesome in my opinion like the whole thread is just very very cool um but yes ben likes to troll a lot uh, I, I just let me just highlight the last tweet he did. It was really, really great. Uh, where was it? Um, was it from him? I think it was from him. No, it wasn't from him. Somebody did a tweet as like, I will explain, um, I will explain concurrent mode in two tweets. And there was no second tweet, basically, <laughs> which was just amazing. Uh, but yeah, anyway, let's continue. Uh, it was him. Okay, so I just couldn't find it. Okay, cool. Uh, right, continuing, we got a uh, Chrome 79 beta announcement. So why I wanted to highlight this, uh, because you know, it's not exactly a complete release yet, is because it ships with WebXR device API. So you now will be able to develop WebXR stuff right on your browser, like in a desktop and do um, VR experiences, AR experiences right in a browser. Um, Again, you know, the WebXR device API, is, I think has been around as a spec for quite some time now, and it should be soon supported in Firefox Reality, Oculus Browser, and a bunch of others. It looks pretty good. So if you are interested in VR, definitely check this out. There's some very interesting stuff to do, and uh, it seems like it's gonna be quite easy to actually work with um, WebXR on the desktop. Reactor 60, yeah, I think that was this thing, right? So if I remember correctly, there was a React renderer that was like React VR renderer. No, so 360 was just the 360 panoramic stuff, but there is actually a React, like a full on React VR project. Uh, okay, they actually merged them, I guess. <laughs> right, okay, yeah, cool. Then it is React 360. I think they used to be two different projects. But I guess it is now one. Um, but it, that will be very interesting to see how they will start, you know, developing and evolving that with WebXR because it is indeed uh, very and like if you have something like Oculus Quest or you know any other headset um, the Moonlight's um, 
no, 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 Moon Rider, Moon Rider is what I want to say. Moon Rider is one of the greatest examples of what you can actually achieve by just doing stuff in a browser and it works amazingly well in VR. Well, okay, obviously it won't work here because I don't have a VR headset, but if you have one, do try it. It's actually a really cool open source app, by the way. Um, okay, anyway, continuing, we got uh, releases section. So this is it for the even, we don't even have that many bit sized awesomeness this time around. We got three big releases this time around. The first one is React Beautiful D&D version 12. Um, the major highlight here being the virtual list support. So you can now finally use uh, React Beautiful D&D with virtual lists. Uh, before that, if you ever tried to do that, it was a bit of a pain in ass setup. Now it's very seamless and very easy to do. And now you can do like 10,000 items at 60 FPS with dragging and dropping and all of that works really cool. It's also 30% faster and 40% less memory usage. And there's a bunch of other features. So if you're working with drag and drop, make sure to check this one out. It's a great library. Next release we got here is Emer version five with a breaking change when maps and sets are now treated differently. So do keep that in mind. It's, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's just more of Emer. It's a great little library. So make sure to check it out if you work with, or you want to work with immutable data, I guess. Um, yeah, I, I don't really have much more to say about that. I think we already talked about Emer more than once here. Continuing, we got Formic version two, the uh, Formic shipped with uh, the React hooks support now. That means that you will need React 16.8 or higher. They are also using the unknown types or if you're on TypeScript, it would require TypeScript 3.0 or higher. And there is a change in reset form function that now takes a different uh, parameters basically. So do keep that in mind. The, yeah, it's basically, you know, hooks version of it. So if you work with form validation, make sure to check this one out. Maybe this is what you wanted. All right, that's it for releases. We now have seven demos and that's basically it. A lot less breaking changes than expected. Well, I yeah, I really have to give credit to people who try, uh, what am I doing? What is happening? No. There we go. I really have to give credit to the library maintainers who try to do as little breaking changes as possible. Like, you know, it's, it's always the best way to go about it. Right. But sometimes it's just not possible, but yeah, there's definitely like very little breaking changes in most of those today, at least. Uh, but there we go. Right. Coming to the libraries and demos. The first one we got here for today is react Zen, uh, react utilities for working with APIs. This is a declarative uh, ways, essentially declarative way to fetching data from uh, remote APIs using hooks. Um, essentially, you just define your API as a create mirror function that does something with fetch, for example, right? So, so it can be anything async, honestly, it doesn't have to be fetch, it's just a fetch example here. And then you just use snapshot hook over that API with a specific key and you're done. Looks pretty nice, also supports suspense and um, yeah, I mean, it, it looks pretty pretty neat to be honest. So if you're working with React and you were looking into the declarative data fetching, maybe check this out. Maybe this is exactly what you wanted. Um, yeah, I, I don't really have anything else to say about it. Honestly, it looks pretty nice and neat. Okay, continuing, we got MIT, a tiny 200 byte functional event emitter and pops up. Very simple event emitter it allows you to uh, emit events. And one of the, uh, I guess, core features is allows you to listen to all events when you need that. Other than that, you know, it's, it's just your typical run of the middle event emitter, just very tiny. The next thing we got here is SV, SWR, I guess, uh, React hooks for remote data fetching. Yes, it does indeed looks amazing. So this is the new library from the people at Tide, uh, the ones who brought you now shell and uh, Next.js, for example. And this is essentially um, data fetching using suspense for data. So the concurrent mode and it looks very slick. Like just look at this. This is literally all I have to do to fetch data from the API, right? So it, it looks incredibly simple to use. I haven't tried it yet myself, but from what I've read on the docs here, it looks amazingly well thought through and very, very easy to use. It also supports GraphQL and a bunch of other stuff right out of the box. So you can, you know, use it with pretty much any app you want. And 
uh, yeah, I guess I will be using that in my next project because this looks slick as hell. So if you're working with React and doing a lot of data fetching, do check this one out. Maybe this is exactly what you wanted. All right. Continuing, we got mobile first animations, performant gesture driven animations on the mobile web. This is a basically a collection of a very slick, very nice mobile first animations that, uh, well, basically a very good way to learn animations uh, within React. There's a React Conf talk related to that. There's a bunch of examples here, and there's also a really cool playground where you can uh, basically drag and drop the images, right? And uh, it has this different uh, sliders that you can adjust to see what exactly will happen with the animation. And uh, yeah, you can either make them terrible or you can make them very wobbly, which makes them even, even worse, basically. <laughs> That's a really cool uh, way to learn basically animations within React. So make sure to check this one out. Okay, next thing we got here is Node Clinic. Uh, the Clinic JS diagnoses your Node JS performance issues. So this is something that is actually already at version five, but I never heard about before. It's a performance profiling suit by the Nearform company, and uh, essentially shows you a bunch of. Very nice visualizations of your Node.js app performance, including CPU usage, memory usage, uh, flame graphs, and stuff like this. So it makes it very easy to figure out where exactly is your problem with regards to performance within your Node.js app. Um, it is a GPL license, so that's a problem within your company. Just you know, keep that in mind. Otherwise, it's you know, open source GPL license, which is pretty permissive in my opinion. Uh, looks pretty slick. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Okay, next thing we got here is match, uh, create graphs from your CommonJS, AMD, or ES6 module dependencies. So this basically takes your entry point of the app and then builds a nice graph of your dependencies of what exactly do you require and use. So you can actually see what your app looks like when you, you know, look at the whole um, dependency tree, I guess. Uh, might be useful in some cases, probably not very useful for me personally, but uh, maybe it is for you. So do check it out if that sounds interesting. And the last thing we got here for today is Nova, a relational query layer over MongoDB node drivers. So this uh, seems to aim to abstract relations within MongoDB. Um, I like I, <laughs> I honestly don't know why would I want to do that when the MongoDB has baked in relations that can be a bit of a pain in ass to do but you know uh, yeah it seems like it's it's not exactly a mongoose replacer because mongoose have a full-on uh capability of relations right so it has many to many many to one whatever you want and it also has the auto querying of the nested objects this seems to just do this relational thing with querying which I guess might be useful in some cases, but honestly, I don't know why would you pick that over Mongoose? Maybe you do. So if, if you do, do check it out. This seems to be a pretty nice project. All right, that is it for the libraries and demos. Basically, the last thing I want to highlight here is the devdocs.io. In case you never heard about this, this is a very nice collection of documentation for, well, just about any language library and thing that is open source and available openly, you can find here in a nice format. And it has like a tons of examples and everything for JavaScript, for Ruby, for CSS, for Angular, Ansible, and it's split by versions and it's just crazy. But uh, yeah, if, if that sounds interesting, do check it out. All right, that is actually it from my side. So this is, as I said, super tiny episode today. We're not even half an hour long stream. Um, if you guys have any questions, suggestions, or maybe I missed some links this time around, do send them into the chat right now. If not, we can just wrap it up here. As usual, you can find all the links on the GitHub or on bxjs.dev. Um, if uh, otherwise, you know, yeah, just join our Discord and discuss this stuff. Am I gonna play Shadowlands? Uh, if Shadowlands is the WoW thing, right? Shadowlands, was it the WoW? Yeah, it was the WoW. I am not going to play any Blizzard games unless they fix the whole Hong Kong mess. And honestly, Diablo 4 looks terrible. Uh, Overwatch 2 looks like a cash grab. I am not willing to support that company. I, I mean, I wouldn't play Shadowlands anyway because I got tired of World of Warcraft about seven years ago. Like I played it from the very start until 2013 or 14 or so, and then I got really tired of it. 
And then I just stopped. And I have zero interest in coming back to it, honestly. But, you know, like, even if I had with the current behavior of Blizzard, I just won't. So, no, no way. Uh, but yeah, any other questions, suggestions, or uh, things you guys want to talk about? If not, then we can just uh, end it up here and uh, do something. I don't know. Where there's the new Warframe update with the Kuva Leech waiting for me. So I want that stuff. And uh, yeah. I'll give you a couple of minutes. Uh, meanwhile, I remind you that we have a Telegram channel when I post all the links I gather over the week. So if you are curious about the links that do not make it into the episodes, but I still collect, do check it out. Uh, again, we have a Discord server where you can ask for help about JavaScript or just uh, talk about various libraries and video games and whatever. And uh, that's basically it for today. Right, doesn't seem like there's any more questions or suggestions. So thank you guys very much for watching. Thank you as usual for your continued support. Hope you enjoyed the show and I see you next time. Bye.